Hello everybody, it's Grandmama. Time for another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherax. Here we go. Dick Falconer's Treasure. Hello there. I want to talk about a man you would have liked if you had known him. A man that you probably liked if you did. He was what we called a character. A character who was rich in the story and legend and very much a part of Grays Harbor there once used to be. I should probably explain why Dick Faulkner was important to that Grays Harbor of plank sidewalks and sawdust streets. He was a bookkeeper. There was nothing significant about that. That is, more so than if he had been a plumber or a barber or a conductor on the Hoquiam Aberdeen streetcar. No, that wasn't it. He had come to Grays Harbor from New Brunswick. But that wasn't the reason either. Let's look deeper. In the little frontiers towns that these were in the 1890s, people who had to make their own fun. There were no radios and no motion pictures. The theaters did well if they had lights on twice a week. Once in a while there was a town meeting. There were plenty of lodges which gave every man the opportunity to join one. Yes, and every woman too. But there were very limited fun-making activities as compared to our highly commercialized entertainment world today. So people being what they are, they made their own fun. Some of the population who had a proclivity for fun-making developed that talent. Practical jokers were a dime a dozen. Some of them were famous for their antics. Dick Falkner was a man who became notorious for some of his practical jokes. A man who fabricated the most monstrous tales, most entirely without foundation, just for the love of telling a story. But a man who was so unimpeachably honest that his word was his bond in business. But before we tell you the story of Dick Falkner, I want Dick Crombie to say a few words from our sponsor. Grays Harbor was recovering from the panic of the mid-1890s when a tall, dignified gentleman with a Prince Albert whiskers came to town and got behind a wicket at Harry Hayes' new bank down on Heron Street. His name was Dick Falkner. He had come out here from New Brunswick to be the new bookkeeper. Down in Doc Payne's drugstore, where the young businessmen of the town gathered, Dick was introduced around, and the boys were impressed with his bearing, his ability to speak on any subject, and his impeccable dress. Quite a gent, they agreed. Well, in the months that followed, Dick made many friends. Doc Maker, a dentist, a philosopher, and publisher of the Aberdeen Sunday Sun, liked Dick because he had a sparkling sense of humor and a capacity for spinning a yarn that appealed to Doc's repertorial sense. Ned Finch liked Dick because he had traveled and knew the world and because he showed polish that he had acquired in rubbing against the interest and color of many places and people. Ned also admired some folks thought because he had one person, Ned, that didn't get fooled. Finch's bluster and bluffs seemed to have no effect on Dick Falkner. And the rest of the boys who gathered in Doc Payne's drugstore on the evening liked Dick because he was a gentleman, because he brought a lot of laughs with him, and because he treated everyone well. If Dick had a special friend, it was Al, Dad, Bauer, a fellow worker from the bank. The two good friends from the, from the first day as the years went by, they became inseparable. The tall, dignified gentleman with the Prince Albert whiskers and the small, dark man who shuffled along at his side. Dick was the sort of fellow who made storytelling his baby. It would be inaccurate to say that he ignored the facts. He didn't. There were no facts when Dick told a story. 
the most gargantuan prevalicational stories came out with a coldly serious face and a matter-of-fact air. One day an Aberdeen matron crashed her husband's cashed her husband's paycheck at Dick's Wicket, and after pleasantries, Dick remarked that he felt very upset. Of course, the lady wanted to know what caused him to be upset. Oh, my family is arriving today, he said, with his most serious manner. My wife and seven children are due in here on the afternoon train. I know they won't like to live in a hotel, and I don't know just what to do with them. They're country folk. They've never lived in town before, and they just don't know how to behave. I'm really very worried. Well, the matron knew Dick by reputation, but so seriously did he state his case, and so reasonably, that, well, you've probably guessed it, she invited Dick to bring his family to her home until he could find a place for them to live. When her husband came home for lunch, she had the house in an uproar. The spare bedroom was being refurbished. The kids were being doubled up to make extra room available. And a vast program of cooking, baking, and sewing, new draperies, and even wallpapering was planned. The husband looked on in astonishment. What does it mean? Dick Falconer's family's coming, she said. They'll be here today. His wife and seven children. The husband convulsed was finally able to gasp out a pain fact. Dick had no family. He was not and never has been married. Then there was during the Prohibition era that Dick met late Pop Kidder on the street. And as well as Pop knew Dick Falconer, he knew fell for, he fell for this one. How are you doing, Dick inquired Pop. I've got troubles, Dick confided, speaking very close to Pop's ear. A friend of mine is sending me a cake of beer today, and I don't have a place to keep it. I don't know what to do. So Pop, who would do anything for a friend, offered to make room in his basement. No, Dick didn't feel that that was the place for it. You might be found out, he said. The thing to do is to bury it, but I haven't even a place to bury it. Pop agreed to bury it in his own backyard. I'll handle the whole thing, Pop confided, just before they parted. I'll pick it up at the station, and when you want it, you call me. I suppose you're way ahead of me by this time. Pop hurried home, put on his old clothes, and sweated over a great hole in the backyard. Then, muddy and tired, he climbed into his Grace Harbor Railroad and Light Company truck and met the evening train. And, of course... There was no beer. In fact, no barrel. Pop swore to get even if it's the last thing he does, but he never did. In fact, he told the story with relish. Somehow folks liked being hoaxed by Dick Falconer, who liked to tell about it. But Dick's most famous hoax was one that backfired. It made the newspapers all over the Northwest and drove Dick out of town. I'll tell you about it right after this small message from our sponsor. It was just after the 20th century had come in. The people were trying to adjust themselves to the stepped up pace that was supposed to come with the new hundred years. For months the newspaper had featured a story about a party that was being organized to search for famous Cocoa Island treasures. The Loot of the Lima that was buried on the island in the Pacific just off the coast of Peru. One night in Doc Payne's drugstore, Dick came out with his version. I've got a map, he told those who had listened, and he never had trouble getting listeners. I've got a map, and tomorrow I'm going to begin organizing a party of my own. The rest of these fellows had been working on supposition. But I have facts, and the maps also. I've gone for a few days to charter a ship and line up a crew, and then we're off for the Cocoa Islands. Under probing from his listeners, he enlarged the story. It's been a romantic adventure fraught with danger and ending in fame and wealth. And when the boys drifted home from the drugstore that night, they had a new one to relate about Dick Faulkner. Doc Maker, the dentist, and the editor of the Aberdeen Sun thought it was good 
to stop there. He wrote a story tongue-in-cheek but filled with the so-called facts that Dick had advocated. On Sunday, his paper printed the story, but Dick didn't read it. Dick was on a train bound from San Francisco and his vacation. Nor did Dick read the reprints of the article taken word for word from the sun that appeared in the Portland Oregonian, the C Seattle PI, and other Northwest publications. But other people read them. They were read in Seattle, Tacoma, Puyallup, Vancouver, B.C., Portland, and in fact all over the Pacific Northwest. At Hayes and Hayes Bank, telegrams, letters, and long-distance phone calls began to arrive. Then people from Portland, from Vancouver, and from all over the Northwest began to come into town. They wanted to join the Cocoa Island expedition. They wanted to invest in it. They wanted to share it. Of course, Dick was basking in the sun of California, oblivious to all of it. And so, his two-week vacation passed. It was Monday morning when he returned to his desk. He opened a few letters and found a, a huge stack, and Jim Fuller, assistant cashier for the bank, disappeared into the vault. When he came out, he carried a large-sized wastebasket filled to the brim with even more letters, telegrams, and notes. He dumped them on Dick's desk, the mail cascading down onto the floor. For a while, Dick stared in silence his agile mind reconstructing the events that he had long forgotten. Finally, he pieced it together with the help of a few questions from members of the banking staff. Without opening one of the hundreds of letters and telegrams, he stuffed them all back into the wastebasket and carried them out to the furnace where he spent an hour burning them. They may be checks and money in those letters, some of the bank employees pointed out, but it didn't dissuade Dick. He burnt the letters to the last one, but that had not been the end. The next day, a postal inspector arrived from Seattle to determine if the mail was, were being used to defraud. That took some tall explaining. Billy Patterson himself had to enter the picture and trace the course of the story from a practical joke to another practical joke to a practical riot before the postal inspector was willing to call the whole thing off. Dick considered leaving town for a while, but finally bowed his neck and stuck it out, though it was a long time before he went back to Doc Payne Drugstore to talk about Cocoa Island treasure. And there were other stories about Dick, stories of other kinds. But first, this word from our sponsor. If you didn't know Dick Falkner, you may have gathered the idea that truth and honesty were foreign to his makeup. That's wrong. Dick's word was his bond. He never forgot a friend or a favor. He had been in the West for many years, 20 or more, when a letter came from his old home in New Brunswick. It told of the death of an old friend. It stated that among the friend's personal effects were receipts for an insurance policy of Dick's that would have lapsed 20 years before except for the friend who had kept up the premiums. Dick had forgotten the policy, decided that it had lapsed long ago. He sat down and wrote a check for the full amount of the premiums to the family of the dead man, then canceled the policy. The lumber purchaser from Everett was operating down here on the harbor and made a few loans on shipments. The bank had advanced money and he had paid it back but an investigation of his financial dealings in Everett led the bank to feel that he should be given no extensive credit. Jim Fuller passed the word amongst those who handled the bank papers and then forgot about it. Dick Faulkner became ill one day and finally ended up in the hospital in Portland where he lingered for two years before death came to him. It was some weeks after that that Dick's overcoat, hanging still in the bank's cloakroom, fell to the floor and some papers were strewn around. The assistant cashier, feeling there might be something of value, gathered the papers up and scanned them. One was an income tax report. It contained an item for a 3500 deduction for a bad debt. It was for the money, the bank's money, loaned to the lumber deal by Frank Faulkner, 
who hadn't gotten the word beforehand. But the loss was never charged against the bank. When Faulkner learned the loan had not been repaid, he paid it out of his own pocket. That was Dick Faulkner, the man who never told the truth if he could improve on it, yet whose word was his bond on Grays Harbor away back in the musty past. And some evening real soon, we're going to tell you more about the bank in which he worked, the bank that was an institution known the length of the coast and the man who made it. But tomorrow night, our hometown scrapbook brings you the story of a man who can count 94 years of life in a very interesting profession, and the best of them on Grays Harbor. Thank you for listening. Thank you.